Hi, I'm Marcia Franklin. Welcome to this Dialogue Web Extra. I'm talking with author Richard Russo. You may know him best for his Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Empire Falls. Isn't that cool to always be introduced as a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist? It is. It is pretty neat. As, as someone, <laughs> a friend of mine, a uh, friend of mine, when I got the prize, uh, called and said, "Well, they just wrote the first, the first line of your obituary." <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I unfortunately was thinking about too. But it's better than something that's, else. That's right. There could have been other first lines that wouldn't be nearly yeah. as attractive. Where were you when you found out? I was playing tennis actually with a friend of mine. Yeah, I, this. Empire Falls had not even been shortlisted for any of the other major awards, and the Pulitzer is last, of course. So I thought, oh, Rick, don't be an idiot sitting around <laughs> waiting for the phone to, uh, uh, to ring. So, so my, wife, so my wife, my wife got to answer the phone, and then uh, and, and for 45 minutes, because we had a long match that day, for 45 minutes, um, uh, the, the phone just did not stop ringing. She was so furious at me by the time I got <laughs> home. Because <laughs> she had to take all the she calls. Had, well, uh, yeah, she, she was... <laughs> She was, uh, I mean, on the one hand, she was, she was, she was so proud and so, yeah. and all that, but she did want to kill me for, for being absent. <laughs> what has it done for you, winning the Pulitzer? Did it open up a lot of doors, or did it create a, more of a burden on you to well, make you Well, you know, book? Wh whenever, whenever you're blessed to win something like this, a, a, a major literary prize or something like that, um, uh, I mean, its most immediate effects are wonderful. Uh, it not only makes that book sell like mad, but it floats your entire backlist. Um, people suddenly who wouldn't have known who you are suddenly do. Um, um, I know I was very glad that I was already 250 pages or so into Bridge of Size because if I if I had not started a book yet, I think it might have I think it might have had some sort of paralytic effect on me. But since I was already a couple hundred pages into it, but I know it did make me want um, it did make me want to be worthy of the prize because that there were a couple dozen other books that year, at least novels that that, that could have won the prize and nobody would have, would have had the slightest complaint. Um, so um, when you're lucky enough to, to, uh, to be chosen that year, then you kind of, you kind of want to do your, your best work um, to, to show that the judges weren't complete idiots and that, that, cause everybody has, everybody has another favorite book that they, that they'll, that they'll tell you should have won that, should have won that year. So you don't want to make them right. <laughs> What'd your mom think? Oh God, she was, um, she had, she had the most difficult time wrapping her mind um, around that, but she'd been having, she'd been having those kinds of difficulties for a long time anyway, because she, um, um, she made me a writer in the sense that she made me a reader. Um, and, and, um, but she thought when I finished my PhD that I was going to be a professor. And when I announced that I was going to be a writer, it really threw her into an incredible tailspin. She thought I was being, uh, among other things, because I was, I was by then married and, uh, my wife was, my wife was pregnant with our first daughter and she thought I was being incredibly selfish to, to, to risk my family. She was a child of the depression and to risk my family in, in, in that way. Uh, and then to write these, to write all of these books about this town that she and then, and, and, and I were escaping. And then I go back and I write all these stories about these grungy mill towns. And then, and then talk about something you can't get your mind around. And then one of those is turned into a movie where my father, her husband, is played by Paul Newman, her favorite movie actor of all time. Well, how, how in the world could you expect, could you expect anybody to get their, their mind around that? And she was, I mean, it was, it was years. She, she kept saying, it's, it's like it was happening to somebody else. And that was the, that was the only way that she could. And then, and then when the, and, and then when uh, the Pulitzer came, it was just, it was like Paul Newman all, all over again. <laughs> so she had a, um, she, she, she could not have been more proud, but, um, but it was, it was, um, it was like an episode of a, of a, of some sort of fantasy that, that, uh, was lacking a key element of realism <laughs> to her. Well, how wonderful she was alive yeah, and, and yeah, could understand yeah. that. Um, you have opportunity to teach mm -hmm. now. Um, first of all, do you encourage young writers? to keep going if that's in it, if that's their passion? Do you, or are you discouraged with the state of the industry that you're part of? Uh, and tell them, well, you know, write, but make sure you have another job. 
Well, um, the, the state of the the state of publishing right now is uh, I would just describe as complete flux, um, uh, and um, a lot, a, because a lot of it just has to do with electronic books. The price of electronic books, because you don't have to make a real book, it's possible to drive which ebook retailers are doing. It's possible to drive the the price of ebooks down so low. That and I have nothing against ebooks. I have a reader myself, uh, but the price can be driven so low that it actually endangers the economic model for print books. And people say very blithely, "Oh, we'll always have print books. People love books." Well, it really doesn't matter whether they love them or not. If they can't be made economically, then they won't be. It's like any other. It's like any anything else that is that is made. If you can't make money making it, then you're not going to make it. Um, which which is which means that the industry is changing right before our eyes. And it's changing um, not just for writers, it's changing for literary agents. Will we have literary agents 10 years from now? Will, will my publisher, um, um, Knopf, Random House, will it exist in the, form, in the form that it exists now? All those editors, will they be freelance people? Um, and, and ask anybody in publishing, uh, and the primary emotion when you start talking about publishing, the primary emotion that you see out there is fear, because nobody uh, really knows right now what the next step is, is going to be. Now, for young writers, I think it's, it's particularly difficult, because it's always been, it was difficult for me as a young writer. But it's about 10 times more difficult for young writers now because we have fewer newspapers that do, that do book reviews or that run ads for books. Publishers um, send writers who are household names, um, you know, um, Stephen King, Scott Turow, Richard Russo, Ann Patchett. We all still go on book tour uh, because it's economically um, uh, feasible for them to do so. But not many young writers are going on book tours where they can, you know, go to bookstores and, and meet booksellers and, and meet potential readers. So the, the, the support system, the life support, the ecosystem that used to, that used to um, nourish young writers, I mean, publishers used to be kind of, um, um, what, what they would do is they were kind of venture capitalists. They would, they would give money to a writer and say, all right, now go home and write a book. Um, Amazon's not going to do that. Uh, e Google Books is not going to do that. Uh, so the, the entire ecology, the entire support system for young writers, um, um, is, is most of it is gone. And what it's been replaced by, um, you know, um, Facebook and social media types of things where you can get the word out about mm -hmm. certain things, but, but it's, um, we're still kind of working our way through that, and young people are really smart about how to, how to use uh, social networking. But what my advice to young writers is right now, if you have to, then do, because you have to. I, I had to, and I would, I would never tell any r young writer that you shouldn't do something that you absolutely have to do. But by all means, do it with open eyes. I mean, un un right. under understand that um, if you're in it to make money, you can make money almost, almost Choose something else. <laughs> you'll make money. You'll 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 make money so much quicker well, I know doing almost anything. I know else. a young 19, a nineteen year old writer. She's so excited because she's self published. Mm -hmm. Because you can, it does make it more accessible. Yes. Uh, for yes. for young uh, the gatekeepers for, 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 for writers and accessible in some instances for readers too. Yeah. The prices come down. A lot of the gatekeepers are gone. Right. So, so you, you, if somebody says no at a at a major publisher, you can no. Right. Uh, uh, and the stigma to self-publishing too is is, is largely uh, disappeared. So there are certain there are certain advantages to uh, to to the technological revolution that we're in the midst of. And of course, one hopes that quality rises to the top in the end. One hopes. And when you talk with students who have made the decision to at least try writing, you, as I understand it, uh, really work with them on character, mm -hmm. developing character. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and, yes. And uh, because so many writers, if I understand what I've read about you, uh, read you say, um, they, they might concentrate just on one, a protagonist and mm -hmm. an antagonist, forgetting that our lives are made up, all of our lives are made up of what we might call minor characters, too, who really aren't that minor. Right, right. So is that one of your... Yes, the minutia, the, the minutia of, of life um, is... 
it's not just that it's more important than you might think at first glance. It's that if you study it, um, very open, very often the physical world, the objects, not just the people who are there, but the objects that you people that world with are, are doors that you can walk through into the, into the next layer Literally doors. of doors. I mean, you could yeah. put a door in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Literally. And, 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 these, and these small things, and, and, and young writers have to understand, too, that there, there are no such thing as small lives. And so, I mean, Dickens knew that. Uh, Dickens knew the value of Mr. Micawber turning up and stealing a scene. Um, uh, unfortunately, stories um, now are being told in a lot of uh, in a lot of different ways. It's not just writers now. We have television and film, and and unfortunately, um, a lot of a lot of young writers think about storytelling the way producers think about tent tentpole movies. You know, the next um, the next the next giant hundred and fifty million dollar. Um, movie um and if, if if you think about if you think about everything big as a young writer uh it's 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 very difficult you indeed. miss life you miss yeah life you, you miss you certainly miss the nuances and humor too we didn't get to talk about that in the main part of the program but even in your memoir of your mom which was full of uh very stressful experiences mm -hmm. there's there's humor in there and there's humor thank you Yes. 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 <laughs> well, there has to be, you know. Uh, uh, Even in the hospice book that we were talking about, one of the one of the one of the I mean, uh, that's that's a book about about um, end of life and end of life uh, issues. But one of the difficulties in 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 writing um, uh, and selling uh, a book about end of life care is that readers think that that it's going to be um, about people sitting in an overhead room under fluorescent lights watching someone that you love more than your more than your own self die and the hos even in the hospice book um, the the um, the humor um, that infects because it cannot help that but but in fact um, our lives is is represented I think um, very forcefully in reading that reading that book uh, is is not an is not an exercise in in duty or or uh, uh, anything like that. That's that's um, these these things these things mingle as well, Mark, they should. Mark Twain knew that as well. Mark Twain knew that as well. I mean, who wa who would want to read Huckleberry Finn, which is a study in the underbelly, the underside of everything that it is that that is American in that was American in the culture of his time. Violence, bigotry, ignorance. I mean, it was not a flattering portrait, but he has us laughing every step of the way. As we close here, I know your, your uh, mantra is when you don't know what to do, try something. If that doesn't work, try something else. That's right. So I assume for young writers out there, you just say, keep trying. It's hard work, but as I think you've also said, not writing can be harder if you have that inside of yourself. Yes. Quelt it, or you know, keep it down is can be worse. Yes, and then you find your then you then you find yourself at, at the end of uh, at, at when you find yourself getting to be my age, realizing that you've lived somebody else's life for for whatever reason, what somebody else wanted you to do, what, and and maybe you've ignored that person that you feel you were destined to be simply because you didn't want to take a chance. Um, so if you must, you must. If you must, do. Great. Well, I'm glad you have. Thank and you. And we'll continue to, and hope you visit us again. Thank you, Marcia. Thanks so much. You've been listening to author Richard Russo in this Dialogue Web Extra. I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks so much for tuning in.